All right. Well, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for the weekend. So, Bill Watson, if you want to go ahead and head on up here. So, we got Bill Watson this weekend. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. Um, so, Bill has spoken um, at our Focus Pizza Theologies a few times a while back. So, I got to hear him speak at some of those. Um, yeah, just really enjoyed uh, just the things he shared, the uh, insight he has into um, just speaking about the gospel and the story of the Bible and, and all of that. So, we're really excited that he agreed to come out and speak to us this morning. He's a pastor here in the Dallas area, um, was a professor uh, at Criswell College, I believe. Um, so yeah, just uh, a really neat heart for God. I've gotten to spend some time talking to him and just I can tell he has the heart of a pastor. So I'd encourage all you to just open your hearts this weekend um, to the word of God that Bill has to speak to us. And let's be active participants as he speaks. So if he says something that you know is true, let's affirm it and say amen or yep. And um, yeah, just be in agreement with the word of God that's spoken to us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer and then I'll turn it over to Bill. Um, God, I pray for Bill. I just thank you that, um, yeah, that he's willing to come bless our church um, by speaking your word to us and by, um, yeah, just speaking on this topic of gospel hospitality. Um, we ask that your spirit would be with him as he speaks, um, that everything he says would be your words to us and that you would Help us to be attentive listeners um, this weekend and that we would, um, yeah, not just hear your word, but that we would change in response to it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike? Okay. There we go. All right. Hey, guys. Really glad to see y'all. Glad you're here today and glad I got invited out to hang out with you guys again. I've done some things with Focus, like James was mentioning just a minute ago. And I've always loved everything I've ever done with Focus, and I know y'all are closely tied to that, so I'm glad to be here with your church this morning to talk to you about what I think is one of the most important things for the church to talk about always, but particularly in the 21st century. So I'm glad to be here with y'all. look forward to spending time with you. If you have questions afterward, love to talk about it, because my hope is really just to encourage y'all as much as I can with the love of God and with his purpose for your life. And I'm just consumed with that. God has called me to ministry. He loves, he's loved me so profoundly through the years. So any chance I get to kind of encourage you guys is just a blessing. So thanks for having me out here. And uh, hopefully we can learn some things about what the Lord intends for us today. So we're going to be talking about a topic that I think is actually being uh, raised more often now. And I'm really glad about that. Uh, it's the topic of hospitality. Uh, hospitality is one of the most important things for Christians to practice. All throughout Scripture we're told this over and over. The idea of hospitality permeates the whole scriptures, okay? Now, I know, obviously, I can tell a lot of y'all are very young. You probably don't have a home with a wife and kids or a husband and kids and a dog and a picket fence and all that yet. So you might be thinking, well, what, is this, what does hospitality have to do with me? Because if you, if you know what hospitality is, hospitality is, in, in scripture, hospitality is not exactly like it is for us. We, we define it a little differently these days than the Bible does. In scripture, what hospitality is uh, it's expressed in this Greek word, which is, which is philizenos, which is the word love and stranger. So in the New Testament, you go to places like 1 Peter chapter 4, which we may end up talking about probably in the second or third session. 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter tells the church that the end of this world is at hand. So in chapter 4, verse 9, he says the world is about to end. And this is, he's saying this in the first century. You might think that was 2,000 years ago. So, you know, uh, what, what happened or what didn't happen, right? But Peter does also say in that book that for God, a, a year, a thousand years is like a day. His point is to say in 1 Peter 4 that every one of us should live our lives understanding that the very next thing that's going to happen in world history, the next big event of God's movement in history is going to be the return of Christ and the end of this age. And, and what he, this is really interesting, and again, we'll talk about this probably later, but at that moment when he tells the church, you're supposed to live like any day could be the last day of this age and the beginning of the fullness of the age to come. New earth, new creation, resurrection, all that. That could happen today. Even though it's been 2,000 years, it's still the case that it could happen today. You're supposed to live every day as though it could be the one in which Christ returns. You would think that in chapter 4 of First Peter, he would then say, all right, here's the radical stuff you do, given the fact that God could come back at any moment, right? And you all know that when people think, about the end of the world, they tend to get some pretty radical ideas. You ever, you ever been around somebody, and maybe some of you are like this, and I love you to death, so I hope I'm not stepping on any toes, right? <laughs> Have any of you ever been around the kind of person who thinks constantly about the world ending, constantly, and goes out and does crazy things because they believe the world's about to end? I mean, I know, and, and there's all kinds of different responses we have to this if we really believe the world is about to end. Uh, and, and, you know, you can see it in things like doomsday preppers. I mean, I, I know a guy, I used to work for a guy. Uh, when I was uh, worked for an oil company, I was a rig hand, and we and he, he we buried 
a gigantic metal tube the size of this room in the ground so that he could have a nuclear bunker in case the because he was he believed the apocalypse was about to happen. He thought the world was about to end, so he wanted to bury this giant metal cylinder insulate it, put in a ventilation system, and build a bunker for the end of the world so that when the nuke hit, he could take a few people down there, share the gospel with them, save them like Noah's Ark, and I don't know what he was going to do from there. Like, I was like, you're going to get down there and close the hatch, you're going to look around and go, what are we going to do now? I mean, you can't go back up, right? Uh, but here's the thing. When Peter says the world's about to end in 1 Peter chapter 4, he doesn't tell you to go build a bunker. He, he doesn't tell you to go out and, and you know, um, I, don't, I don't know. He, you can think of all the radical things he might tell you to do. He doesn't tell you to do any of those. He doesn't say stockpile, you know, a bunch of canned goods and water. He didn't say go out there and get, make sure you have your AR-15. I know how much we love AR-15s in this world. I, I get that. He didn't say stock up your weapons, get a contingency plan. He didn't say any of that stuff. It's interesting that in the midst of saying something like the world is about to end and every day it could end and you should live every day like it could end, here's what you should be doing. Here's the radical life that you should be living if you think the world's about to end and Christ is about to return. He says... Be sober-minded and self-controlled for your prayers. And which doesn't sound very radical. He just says, be serious about life and be self-controlled so that your prayers will be more effective. And then he says, love one another earnestly. And then he says, uh, probably what in our culture might be the most radical thing of all, he says, show hospitality to one another. Show hospitality to one another. That word, zelophenos, is there. Okay? Now, if, if you actually look throughout the New Testament, Romans 12, Hebrews chapter 13, Matthew 25, as we'll see later, we're commanded constantly to practice zelophenos, love of the stranger, hospitality. And in the New Testament, what that means is to... It, love in the New Testament is not a, a benign feeling that comes upon you. Love in the New Testament is manifest in a proactive, uh, a proactive care for others. I mean, if you want to think of what love is in the New Testament, you look at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what love is. Love is the proactive seeking of strangers. Seeking of strangers. And then the giving of your whole self for their flourishing. I mean, zeolophenos is, is, is a word that shows up a lot, but the idea is everywhere. The gospel of Jesus Christ we're going to see over the next three sessions is a story of hospitality. Today we're going to focus, or at least today, we're, right now, we're going to focus on the creation story, oddly enough, and see how hospitality is fundamental to what it means to be a human being. But it is the case that the gospel itself is a story of someone building a home and then going out and finding a bunch of strangers and giving it all to them, saying, come eat at my table in Lord's Supper. Come sit and feast on, my, on the bread of my, of my pantry, which happens to be his own body. Come, he calls the stranger in, he loves them, he seeks them, and then he cares for them. And that's what Zelophenos is. It's the use of your home and your life to care for people who have no claim on it whatsoever. Strangers. It's love of strangers by caring for them. Okay? And this is a radical idea in our culture because, and this is the, by the way, this is, it's really hard for me to come to something like this and, and have three 45-minute sessions. I'm, I'm like, all right, let's talk about this for like 15 hours. This is a really major topic, okay? So you can tell I'm going to spit pretty fast here. This is how I roll. Okay, if you've been to Focus before, you know this is just how he talks. So, you know, buckle up. Yeah, I, I tried slowing down one time and I lose my thoughts. Like, I just, I'm actually losing my train of thought right now. So let's keep going. Uh, so anyway, uh, where was I even? Uh, yeah. This happens to me all the time when I slow down. Uh, so hospitality in, um, oh, 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 yeah. This is a radical idea in our culture for many reasons. But let me just give you a couple real quick. It's a radical idea in our culture, the idea of, of, of us proactively opening up our home to strangers and taking what is rightfully ours and spending, and I want you all to hear this, like Christ on the cross, spending all of it, not some of it, everything he's given you, directing all of that towards the love and care of people who have no rightful claim on it, which is what the cross of Jesus Christ is. In our culture, our homes, our lives, our possessions, and when I talk about hospitality, it's about our home, but it's also about our general possessions, and we'll see how this folds out over time. But as you think about taking your home and what God has given you to bless strangers in your life and to love them, it obviously runs smack dab into the middle of what our culture has taught us our home and possessions are really for. We live in a consumerist society that has taught you that the primary purpose of your home is to be a place where you can go and enjoy your stuff that you worked hard to earn. Now, I'm a firm believer in responsibility, working hard. I'm a believer in freedom. I'm a believer in the right of possession. But I don't believe the right of possession exists so that you can enjoy all your stuff alone forever. In our culture over the years, we've gradually we've moved away from communal life into this suburban life where what we do is we amass as much wealth as we can, build boxes big enough to hold all that junk, and then we get in our homes, we lock the front door, and we sit on our couch, and we eat our pizza, and we watch our TV. All the while, there are people outside of our homes who need to know about a God who didn't do that. 
about a God who did something very different. We need to know about a world where there's actually open doors and full tables made available to those who are hungry. And so it's a very radical idea in our culture. I mean, you might even be thinking, it's a little extreme to say that you should take everything you possess and spend all of it for others. That's a radical idea, but that is the cross of Jesus Christ. When you see him hanging naked on the cross, he, for you, sought you out when you were a stranger. This is Ephesians chapter 2. He sought you when you were a stranger. And he didn't spend a little bit of what was his to bring you into fellowship. He didn't spend just a little bit of what was his to bring you into the family of God. He didn't spend just a little bit of his goods, his resources, to bring you into the family of God, the household of God. The gospel is all about hospitality in the sense that when you think of the church as the house of God, you've been invited into his house to eat at his table. Again, that's what Lord's Supper represents. But think about what Christ spent on you strangers to draw you near, as Ephesians 2 says. Did he hold anything back at all? I mean, the whole point of Ephesians 2, 5 through 11 is he didn't even hold on to divinity. Not, not, it's, I know that's a confusing statement, but Ephesians 2 says he did not consider his equality with God something to be held on to. And it's rightfully his, and it's not rightfully yours. But he said, for the sake of the strangers that I love, because the Father loves them, we'll see some of the grounding of that in creation here in just a minute, because of the love that God had for you strangers, for me as a stranger, even enemies, a lot of strangers are enemies, and we were strangers and enemies. Jesus Christ of Nazareth gave not just a few material goods, he gave his very life, his honor. He was stripped naked and killed for you and I, using his blood, his body, his clothing, all, all those resources were spent so that you could come into the house of God and feast at God's table. So what I want to do is over the next few lessons, as much as I can try to squeeze, as, I'm going to try to squeeze as much as I can in the Bible about where hospitality shows up. And we're going to start in the creation story. And then later on, we'll probably look at Matthew 25. And I'm still working on what the other one is. Not because I don't know, but because I'm trying to think, which one are we not going to do? So uh, go ahead and open to Genesis chapter 1. And while you're turning there, let me say one last thing about why I'm excited about telling you guys this. So I know this is a room with multiple generations. I know a lot of y'all are young, though. And like I said earlier, when I go on and on about hospitality, it's going to be hard for some of y'all to identify with it because you might still be living at home. You might be living in an apartment with three roommates and you have literally one spoon between all of you. Right? You, you might be thinking, I, I don't really have a life that I can do. Like, you might even, might even have a car, right? You might have a very limited means for hospitality. But let me just say two things before we get into this so that you're, you stay connected. It doesn't matter what you possess, you possess something. And by the time we're done, you're going to see you can be hospitable with just your time, which all of you have some to spend. So it doesn't matter how little you have, you can be hospitable with whatever little bit you have. But the second reason why it's important is because part of the beauty of telling you young people about hospitality is you don't have to begin in the wrong direction. You know, you're in the process, Lord willing, and you should be. We'll see in the creation story. You should be trying to build a home. That's a good thing for a man or woman to do, to try to build a home and to try to find someone to live in that home with in covenant marriage and to raise children in that home. Now, some are called to singleness, yes, but there's something about building a home that we'll see in a moment is very much at the heart of what God intended human beings to do in this world. And you should be trying to do that. You should be working at it. And note, you don't slide into adulthood. You don't slide into marriage eligibility. You should be working hard to become the kind of person who can build a home, fill it with life, and then use it to bless the world. And so what I'm, what I'm really encouraged by telling you young people about this today is you can begin to think about your degree, your classes, your whatever, whatever you're doing now. You can begin to direct that towards the building of a life that you can give to the stranger. And that, I guarantee you that will change your perspective on what really matters in terms of your time, your money, your attention, all of that, okay? So in Genesis chapter 1, what I want to do is show you how it is that hospitality is actually at the heart of what it means to be a human being, to be a real human being. You all get that we're not, we're not fully human. It's, it's a weird idea that I know a lot of people, I, I'm tempted to go into like three hours talking about how it is that we're not fully human. We're broken humans. We're not perfected humans. We look kind of like real humans, but we're not entirely real humans. What I mean by that is insofar as we've fallen from our created purpose, we don't look like our proper selves. <laughs> we're twisted, we're bent, right? And you don't go look at fragments on the ground to figure out what something is supposed to be. Broken images do not tell you what you're supposed to be. My point is this, as we look in the creation story, we're going to see a picture of how God intended human beings to live, what he intended us to be. And as a consequence of seeing that in the creation story, we're going to be able to see how we, by the grace of God, through the, uh, the cross of Jesus Christ, and by the power of this Holy Spirit, can, in our homes, begin to do two things. First, for our own sakes, become true human beings. 
who do what we were made to do. And if, if that doesn't strike you as interesting, just think about the fact that, that, that <laughs> when something is made for a purpose, it's no good for that thing not to fulfill its purpose. And one of the reasons why human beings are so miserable, so frustrated, is because we're not living the life God intended us to live. And I don't mean by that he intended for us to have yachts and Bentleys and you know, I don't mean the health, wealth, prosperity. Guy. Yeah, I know, it's like shucks. I, you came here just to hear that, didn't you? And now you're like, I'm out. I'm going home, right, uh, <laughs> in my Honda, and I'm not going to get a Bentley, right? I, I don't know what you drive. <laughs> I don't drive a fancy car either, okay? So, but all that said, uh, um, I don't mean your best life now in that way of speaking. What I mean is to be fundamentally human, to fulfill the purpose God gave us, brings with it a deep and abiding shalom in our souls. We will never be satisfied when we operate outside the design God has made for us. So one of the things I love about hospitality is that when you practice hospitality in light of the creation story, you have an opportunity to experience the joy and the peace that comes from a gracious God equipping you finally to be what Adam was supposed to be, what the second Adam was, what the second Adam showed us a real human being acts like. And you will find deep joy and peace in fulfilling God's purpose in your life. You're going to need grace along the way. You're not going to be perfect at it, but it's, it is a powerful thing. And I talk a lot about shalom, something that only comes from fulfilling God's purpose in your life. Okay? The second reason why is because when you do this, when you practice hospitality and understand it as a fulfillment of God's created purpose for humanity, you're going to put on display what God intended not just for you, but for the stranger who's looking for a better life. For the stranger who's tired of the chaos, the darkness, and the death of this world, you are going to, in fulfilling God's created purpose for you through hospitality, you're going to create an oasis in your home where somebody who's tired of darkness, death, and chaos can come, and they can see light, order, and life. I just had a friend over, uh, we will get in the text right after this, because that's the main thing. I'm a preacher. I love the, the Word of God. It's where the power is. But I will just say, I just had a friend over who was, uh, he was a friend of mine in my childhood for years, best friend for a long time. Well, he became an atheist. Uh, he was a Christian. We were both Christians in the same church. He played in the worship band, you know, but, but there's false conversion out there, y'all. Uh, many people say, Lord, Lord, did we not know you? And they don't know him. And, he, and this guy just realized, I don't believe in God. So he left the faith in his teens and is an atheist. Sweet guy, wonderful guy. Y'all don't know him, so I'm going to use his name. His, da- his name is Dan. If you happen to meet Dan, don't tell him this. Well, you can tell him this story, whatever. You're not likely to he doesn't even live in this state. All that said, Dan came from out of state to stay with my family because we're still good friends. We still love each other a lot. He knows I'm a preacher. It's weird. You know, I'm a preacher boy. He's an atheist, but it works because he's a stranger and I love him. Uh, so he came and stayed in my house for two days. It was interesting that when he left, you know, you know when you have like lost people in your life, you're always wondering, what do you say? What's that perfect thing you can say? What's the perfect argument? How do you over... Lost people you love and know are really hard to minister to, right? How do I get the conversation going without being super awkward? Little note, it's usually always awkward, so just let it be. doesn't matter, you know? If you can do that, it's just going to be awkward. Then you're, you're free to be awkward. You can even tell them, I have something awkward to say to you. I do that. It's so like when I meet people sometimes, they'll look at me, they'll be like, hey, this, you know, I, I, I hate Christianity. I'm like, well, I have an awkward thing to say to you, and that is, and I tell them, and then it's awkward, and it works. I'm not saying it saves them. I'm just saying it. We have the conversation. But Dan came over, and when he left, you know, I'd spent the whole weekend praying to the Lord, Lord, show me what to say. I mean, I, Dan, I've had these conversations. He's, he's got no doubts about what I believe. And I just felt really led just to love him. I prayed. I talked about the Lord the way I normally do. I didn't add, you know, I didn't slather on some extra Jesus to try to get this guy to believe. I just talked my family. He came. He brought his daughter, his wife. We hung out for two days, went to a state park. It was fun. When he left, I kind of thought, well, maybe I didn't really quite do the job I needed to to love him. We fed him and had him over. They slept in our beds. They used our shower. We went and played in the, in the neighborhood, all that. I got a text from him later. It was interesting. He said, you know, being at your home showed me I don't know what peace is, what tranquility is. And, he, and, and he, interestingly, the way he says, I need to go find out how to find the tranquility of your family because we're uptight, stressed, and, anxi- and anxious. And he was just struck by the peace of the Watson home by God's grace. And that, is a, that may be, I'm praying, that may be a big turning point for Dan where he's seen something he's never seen before and doesn't have. Okay, so I'm saying a house that is modeled on the creation story and on the new creation story is a testimony to strangers of what God always intended, and people need to hear what God always intended. All right, so Genesis chapter 1, I'm just going to work through it. I'm already telling I'm going to run out of time, so I'm just going to speed through this, okay? Try right, to stick with me. All right, in Genesis chapter 1, we have this famous story in which uh, God is going to tell us a whole lot about what he wants for us. And this is huge, y'all. We often read this story as like, yeah, this is how you argue against evolutionists. Look, I'm a six-day creationist. I, don't, I assume some of y'all aren't. Uh, hopefully most of y'all are. I think it's a good thing to believe. I don't think this passage exists primarily as an argument against atheism or against evolution. That's not the purpose of it. 
uh, you'll notice that there's this very interesting thing that the God of the universe who could have clicked his fingers and made the whole world exactly like it is in an instant decided to do it over seven days. He decided to do it through a very complex process and then to tell us that complex process. And the reason why he tells us that complex process is simply this. He didn't want to just create the world and miss an opportunity to give us a lesson. He's going to create the world a certain way to communicate to us. This is a theologically driven process. He, by the end of this story, I want us to see certain things about God that we see in this story, certain things about us and what that means for hospitality. Okay, So that's why the story is written the way it is. Now, you can use it to argue that God created the world. Great, you should. You should, I think you should believe in, in, in creationism. But that's not what the story is here for. And when we emphasize that, we miss it. So let, what is God trying to tell us here about himself and about us by doing creation this way and telling it this way? So verse 1 of Genesis 1 starts off like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So uh, as we work through this passage, I'm going to assume a lot here. I know you all love the word. I know you've, you've been involved with a church that loves the word. So I, I know you believe already. I hope you all believe anyway that God created the world, and that by virtue of the fact that he pre-existed us and created the world, that we ought to assume that he's smarter than we are. Okay, We laugh, but that's, we often don't assume that, right? Anytime you get frustrated with God, by the way, you are saying, I think I'm smarter than you. And I, I promise, anytime you get frustrated with God, anybody gets frustrated with God, they're saying, yeah, I'm a finite little peon that can't even really quite figure out how to I don't know, um, you know, open a Capri Sun. But, yeah, I, so that's how limited I am. But I do think I know more than an infinite creator. So just keep that. It's a very important statement to keep in mind. Every time you're frustrated with God, you're saying, I know better than you do. So let's just get that out of the way. We don't. So this whole thing he's doing here, he's telling us how we ought to think. Okay? But it's not just that. By virtue of being the creator, everything belongs to him. He owns everything. It's so facto. I mean, everything belongs to him. We have no right to question his privilege to do whatever he wants. You belong to him. You are a possession of God, and he can do with you whatever he wants, and he's just in doing it. And you might be frustrated by that at points, but it's a good thing that you belong to God, not yourself. Uh, think of the train wreck you've made of your life in different ways, right? And I'm talking about myself, too. Uh, and then, uh, 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 lastly, if he's the designer, the assumption should be that to function well in his design, we should follow his design for us. In other words, if he's going to create boundaries and, and he's going to put everything in its proper place, we should never assume for a moment that we can walk into that world and just create our own tune to play when he's the orchestral director and the writer of the song. If you try to go against the way God designed the world, you won't find happiness and bliss. You're just going to find discord and chaos in your own life because there's a way it's supposed to be, and you didn't design it that way. You're not smart enough to do that, not powerful enough to do that, and to get outside of God's way of doing things just creates discord. And this is hugely important with hospitality. Because I do believe that the home of the Christian, by and large, has been more shaped by a consumerist society than by Scripture. And one of the most chaotic places as a pastor, in fact, the most chaotic place I constantly deal with, the most dark and horrible, painful place I deal with is homes. And by homes, I mean families. That's where the greatest pain in our culture exists. I mean, somebody from, I don't know, Al-Qaeda can come over and kick you in the face and shoot you, and that's a horrible experience, but you don't feel betrayed. They're an enemy. There's something about homes. These vulnerable, powerful places. Some of you all right now have thoughts and memories of your own home that are horrible or, or painful. No matter how good your home was, there's some pain there. I'm just telling you all, if we don't pay close attention to the design for our homes, it will bring only misery, death, and chaos into our homes. And I think Christians have lost sight of what God intended. We've allowed our homes to be more consumeristic than God-oriented. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So God creates the world in the beginning. And in verse 2, I want you to notice a few things here. I love this. I wish we had years to talk about it. We kind of do if you, you know, well, we, you know okay, we, we, we wish we did. We don't. I just mean we get to talk about it as a church globally all the time. But, but uh, when he creates the world, you have to pay attention to the themes and images that happen in this creation story. And some of y'all may actually have heard me talk about this one element at a focus meeting years ago. I don't remember when it was. Uh, but it's important. When you're watching this creation story, you have to look at the themes and images because you're invited into a world you're supposed to feel and hear, and smell, and see. Okay? This is a beautiful story. Don't rush through it. Here's what I mean by that. The way God creates the world in verse 2 is very strange. He, when he first forms it, you get this impression that what he's going to do over the story is sort of plop down the raw material of this world and then begin to fashion it over time. So he's going to begin moving things. If you note in the creation story, after verse 1, there's no mention, and this is true of the Hebrew words for creation used, there's no mention of God making new things after this out of nothing. He creates everything that exists, the material that exists, and then he begins like a potter to shape and mold things into new things. It's like, like humans. Humans are made from dust. He takes it and shapes it. My point is to say, 
that God's going to develop the earth over time, and that process matters significantly. So look at how the world begins. It's a little strange for us when we think of God as perfect, because he is. I'm not going to argue against that. But this early world in verse 2 is not a pleasant place. Uh, You can ask questions about how could God design a world that is described as dark, chaotic, and dead. But that's what this story describes. Okay, so look at verse 2. It says here, the earth was without form and void. I have to rush through this, but I hope y'all can track with this, okay? The idea of a world that is formless and void, if you were to think about images and kind of what images go into the positive bucket, like, you know, the happy, cheerful, sunshiny, picnic day kind of bucket, versus the words that go into sort of like the storm cloud, dark, chaotic, evil, scary bucket, you know, you think of good and evil, basically. There's a good bucket and an evil bucket, and there are different themes and ideas that go into each one. They're related to each other, right? So we don't, we don't think of darkness as good, right? Someone says, are you having a good day? Like, it's a dark day, brother. No one goes, awesome. I'm so glad. How's your family? It's in chaos. Great. I love chaos. Uh, you know, how, how, uh, how's your life going? Well, I feel like I have no firm grounding. I feel like everything's just disordered around me. I don't know where to stand, and I have no anchor. Man, that sounds glorious. I've always wanted a life like that. We don't do that. We recognize that these images are negative. So look at these images here. The world is formless. It's a chaos, is the idea. Formlessness means there's nothing firm. Nothing. There's no boundary to shapes or objects. There's just no firmness to it whatsoever. In fact, in the verse he's going to say in just a moment that the earth, or we'll see in, in verse uh, 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 2, that there's a deep. It's, it describes the world as a deep. An abyss is actually the word in Greek, uh, tohu vabohu, and then tahum, or tahom in, in Hebrew. The idea is that this creation is an abyss. It's just a watery chaos. And so it describes it as formless. There's no firm shape anywhere. There's no chair to sit in, rock to stand on, ring to grab hold of. I just want you to think for a moment about what that evokes in you. This is actually closely tied to a deep and abiding human fear. So if you think about the different things that humans fear, they tend to have this formlessness to them, right? So uh, a common thing we fear, for instance, is darkness. And I'm not above this. You know, I still run between light switches now and then. Uh, I wish I didn't, but I do. Uh, and if y'all are honest, most of you do as well. There's just a point where in complete, like if you've ever been in a completely dark room, like you can't see your hand like this and been there long enough to start to feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Not even necessarily like terrified in a scary movie sense, but just uncomfortable. Do you know why you're uncomfortable in a dark room? Because effectively that room has become formless. Like you ever, you ever notice that what do you do in a dark room when you're trying to move around? You don't just go, you know, marching through a dark room. You start going like this. Why? Because you're looking for a form. You're looking for something to hold on to. And when you find it, that becomes a reference point in the darkness, doesn't it? So you're just sort of like moving around now, trying to, and then where's the next one? And the reason why is because we humans were designed to live in a world that was not chaotic and dark, but to live in a world that was full of order and shape and form. This is why the gospel refers to Christ as our rock in the storm. And that's why it's so often the case that when you're in a dark room and you don't know where anything is and you grab hold of that chair and you know where the chair fits in the room, you're like, ah, oh, you feel that relief. I know where I am. I know what's going on. Humans are bitterly afraid of chaos because chaos is associated with evil. Evil is the destruction of things, not the creation of things. So chaos and evil go together. So this world that begins is chaotic. It's it's formless. It's also void. There's nothing in it. Now, we're going to see there is water in it. It's it's an abyss. It's a a Hebrew word for an ocean, a dark sea. Like in the, it's actually going to come up again in the flood where Noah's going to float over the abyss. Just that black, chaotic deep, right? The sea is a representative of chaos, darkness, and evil in the scripture, which is why in New Creation, Revelation 22, it says there's no sea in creation anymore. Because chaos, darkness, and evil have been done away. It's a symbol. This is why Jesus, to show his power over darkness and evil, what does he do? He goes out on the sea, and he goes, watch this. I control the darkness. I control the chaos. I control the evil. And he tells the abode of demons in the ancient world. They believe demons live there. That's why the swine go back to the water. Oh, I'm in control of this. The point I'm trying to make is this. Insofar as the Earth is this chaotic abyss. The word void doesn't mean there's no material to it. There is this chaotic water. It means it's empty of life. Dead. Nothing living or breathing in this world. It's just a dark, watery, chaotic abyss. So we have a world that is formless, that is dead and empty. I don't mean it's died. I mean there's no life in it at all. It's like a tomb. Like a tomb, I don't know, like Lazarus is going to be buried in, or Christ later. Okay? Just dead, void. And look at the last image here. It says uh, in verse 2 that it was formless and void and darkness. There's that word. Of course, we already get that from the formlessness and void, but darkness was over the face of the abyss. So, I mean, does this describe to you sort of an ideal context? No. I mean, the world initially is a dark, 
chaotic abyss. And even the word there for uh, face of the deep, again, that's that word to home in Hebrew. It's literally the word abusu in the Greek Old Testament. And that's where we get the word abyss from, abusu, abyss. This is pretty dark language. I mean, this is like Lord of the Ringsy Mordor kind of stuff if you're into that. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know, if it's funny, a lot of y'all were born after that movie came out, the first one. That's just, isn't that weird to you? Yeah, how many of y'all were born after 2001? Not very many of you. Okay, that's encouraging. You're not all, <laughs> you're not all babies. That's fine. You guys aren't babies, but that's just weird to me. Yeah, okay. All that said, we're meant to see it. And you might go, well, why in the world would God start the world as a dark, watery, chaotic abyss? Well, it's because he wants to tell you something about him. Because this is not the last time that the world's going to end up like a dark, watery, chaotic abyss. Think of what the images represent. A, a world full of darkness, death, and chaos. But whatever the wrestlings you might have with how could God create a world that starts this way, he's going to show you what happens when the presence of God enters a dark, chaotic abyss. What happens when God is present in darkness, in chaos, and in uh, death? So that's why you have at the end of verse 2, it's not completely empty of life. There is one life in it. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. What you're about to see is what happens whenever God is invited into darkness, into death, and into chaos. Okay? So what does he do? He starts to make things. Uh, I love this in verse uh, 3. It starts off with, and God said. And if you can get one thing through your head, if I can get one thing through my thick head, this is a major idea you have to get. From the very beginning of creation, God has been showing us that when he wants to do something, when he wants to accomplish something, the primary means by which he does it is not with his hands, not with tools. It's with his word. And this is hard for us to get because as a people who are very obsessed with material things and with physicality, we don't think of words as actions. We even have dumb things like, you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We think of words as just sounds, typically. But actually, in the creation epic, God's showing that the most powerful means of accomplishing anything in this world isn't a material manipulation of space with hands or something like that. He doesn't take his hands and shape the world. He doesn't reach over and put the light switch. He doesn't design a light bulb. He speaks. So when God is present and God speaks, things get made new. That's what we're learning here. Okay? And that's going to be huge for hospitality. We're still talking about hospitality, by the way. Okay. Okay. So he speaks, and this is, by the way, why your life should be obsessed with the word of God. So often we're like, why isn't God working in my life? The primary means of his work has always been his spoken word, always. And so if you are not in the word of God, and you're wondering why isn't he working in your life, he's looking at you and saying, the primary means by which I am present and work in anybody's life is sitting on your nightstand. It's my word. That's how I'm present and active. You cannot expect God to do anything in your life if you say, I'm not going to have your means of doing things in my life. To make the universe, he used words. And you all know that in the salvation story, he used words too, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this is very important. He speaks. Part of what, if I, I'm, I, I think I'm probably going to run out of time quite seriously. But I want to say this now. Part of what I'm getting at here is this. Insofar as you recognize that idea, you should fill whatever home you have, however many people are in it, however small or pathetic it might be or grand, your home should be full of God's word if you expect good things to happen. You should be reading it, praying it, meditating on it, singing it. Your home should just be overflowing with the word of God, which is so counter to how our culture lives. You should go well beyond the 10-minute quiet time. You should be seeing it, talking about it, listening to it, discussing it, meditating on it. Blessed is the man who meditates on the word of God day and night. He should be like a tree planted by rivers of water. Okay, So you, you got to see here, that's going to be very important for our, our idea of hospitality. Part of what I'm going to do in this session is establish what kind of home you build to invite people into. Okay, All that said... God speaks and he says, let there be light. So he calls out light in the darkness. And lo and behold, light comes on. And this is one of the, this right here should tell you a lot about our God. When you invite God's presence and word into darkness, he speaks light into that darkness. And he uses the metaphor of darkness and light here because it covers a lot of human experiences. Light reveals things. Light is related to truth. Like, if you, you, ever, you ever been in a situation where you feel like you're just surrounded by liars and lies and deception? You ever felt like you don't understand yourself? That you're not sure who you are? These are all things that happen in darkness. In darkness, there is ignorance, there is deception, there is lies. What's interesting here is that what God's showing is that in a, in a dark context where the truth is not known about self or others and where there's betrayal and deception and sin, God speaking turns the light on and reveals everything for what it is. 
And I love this too. You just, this, this brings to mind the experience I had as a child uh, uh, of darkness. Darkness is a powerful image to me. I was terrified of the dark. Okay? I remember lying in my bed at night. Up at, we lived in a farmhouse, and by God's grace, I guess, there was a pine tree outside my window on the second floor of our farmhouse, and the branches were such that they scraped the window when it got windy. So I don't know if you know, but if you're a five-year-old, you're in a dark farmhouse by yourself on the second floor, and you look out, and there's nothing but blackness, and there's a pine tree just scraping the window, you know, and you just watched uh, a black and white horror movie. You know, it's just a horrible context. I remember very oftentimes lying in the dark, paralyzed by fear, and I'll never forget the power of when I would call, I would call it to my parents, poor souls, and they would come up. I didn't know what sleep meant to them back then. I remember, we, I, my room was right next to the stairs. I remember my dad, because he was, you know, big, strong guy, was just... The stomping would happen, and I just remember the relief I would feel because that meant that in a moment, a powerful, benevolent, providing father is about to flip on the light and get rid of the darkness. And, and we are supposed to see this here and begin to love God before you ever have the gospel and to recognize that, oh, what a great God. And if you have darkness in your life, what do you do? Invite him into it. If you don't know who you are, invite God in your life. He'll shine the light on who you are and who you should be. If you don't know who everybody else is, invite him in your life, and he'll turn the light on. He'll help you understand other people. If you want to know who he is, invite his word and presence into your life and he'll turn on the light and you'll see. And the darkness and the fear will fade away. He'll become a light into your path, maybe. But he turns on the light. So what happens when the presence of God is brought into darkness? Light shines. Next, when we, you'll remember in, the, in, the, in verse 2, we have darkness. Well, that's just been dealt with. We also have chaos. So chaos is that formlessness, right? Uh, I, because of time, I'll, just, I'll, I'll assume you know a lot about this story. He's going to create, well, I'll, I'll show you one verse, and then we'll just, we'll, I'll assume you know how it works out in the following verses. Look at, look at verse 5. Actually, verse 4, excuse me. God saw the light was good. By the way, the word good there means beautiful, useful. It's a very broad word for, for beauty. It's actually the prime word for beauty. So, uh, but that said, it was, it was good, it was beautiful, it was wonderful. And God, look, separated the light from the darkness. You can do a lot of separating. So separation has this idea of creating order. Like my kids have Legos, millions of them. I don't know how they have millions of them. I had like three Legos, three of them <laughs> when I was a kid. And I would make different things out of the. That's kind of, they were expensive, y'all. We were poor farmers. I mean, it was like, what can I make out of three of these things, you know? And I had like half of a minifigure. My kids have millions of these things. And when they're done playing, it is a chaotic mess in their room, Right? Well, when you start to clean that mess, what you do is you start to get in there and start to separate things and put them in piles and boxes and to put boundaries around things. Separation has to do with going into chaos and creating order, creating boundaries and firmness and distinctions. This is what God does. Interestingly, in our culture, we hate someone suggesting that there are boundaries and distinctions that must be held. But you note then all the hell we get as a result of denying the boundaries he created around things like gender and marriage and truth and all that kind of stuff. It's a horrible thing what we're doing to ourselves. Boundaries are good. Uh, we all know that by experience. We just fail to acknowledge it in our souls. So what he does, he begins to separate, which means he's creating order. He's saying to things, no longer do you just mold into this giant abyss where there's no life and chaos. Everything's going to have its proper place. So that he can get to the point of dealing with the third problem. See, here, here by separating, he's dealing with chaos. So he's brought light into darkness. He's brought order into chaos. He's doing that in creation. And that leaves us with one other big problem from the whole situation we saw before, and that is the world's covered in darkness, chaos, and it's just dead. There's no life in it. So we're learning now, you invite the presence of God and the word of God into dark places, he shines light. We also just learned, when you invite the presence and word of God into chaos and disorder, inevitably in time, order begins to propagate. Peaceful order. Boundaries are put up, proper boundaries, not wrong boundaries and order begins to ensue. How many of y'all have ever felt like your life was just chaos? I mean, just absolutely messed up, and you just wish someone would come along and make sense of your life a little bit. Bring things into order. Well, invite God's word into your life. Ask for his presence in your life, and then just wait patiently while his word does what Isaiah 55 says it'll do. That is, do his will. Accomplish his purpose in your life. The more you get away from the word of God, the more you should expect that you're going to live a life of chaos where nothing makes sense and things just fall apart, okay? So that said, God brings order into chaos. Well, the last problem we had in verse 2 was that the world was also dead and empty, it was void. So if you look at the creation story, you'll see he's, he's, he's dealt with darkness. Now he's separating things and bringing about order. Then you get down to verse 11, and he deals with that third problem, that death element, that voidness, and he begins to fill the world full of life. 
So the first thing he does is he speaks vegetation into being in verse 11. So on day three, he speaks that into being. It covers the ground that he's formed out of the sea. Note, by the way, parting the sea there. Anytime God parts the sea, he's bringing order out of chaos. Remember the parting of the Red Sea? There's this, this tomb they can go. They can go in there and drown like Pharaoh's chariots will do in just a moment. That, the Red Sea represents a dark, chaotic abyss where there's nothing but death. And they realize they can't go in there because they'll die. It's just a place of death. And what does he do? He comes and he parts the waters to create firm, dry, shaped ground for them to walk on in the light so that they can get through that chaos. So those themes will emerge all over Scripture. But here's my point. Here you have no life, and because God's presence and God's word is present in that dead place, life emerges. And you'll see this all throughout the Bible. The tomb of Lazarus is a great example. Dark, chaotic abyss where the body of Lazarus lay. It's when Jesus Christ, the word, shows up and speaks his word into the tomb that out of that dark, chaotic abyss comes the well-ordered living body into the light of Lazarus. Okay, Very important. So if your life feels like it's full of death, your soul feels dead, there's literal death in your family, or your body's dying, or whatever it is, if your world is full of death, invite the presence of God and the word of God in your life, and ha! In time, life will come. It'll be through resurrection from the dead and eternal life on a new earth, but I'll take that. I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. Okay? Now, <laughs> so I, I'm going to talk in just a moment about, um, well, let's keep going. I need, I need to get through this. All right, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave a lot summarized here where you know, he creates the, the earth. And, and then, and then in, in, in day four, he begins to put, this is very important, he, he's, by day four, God has built the dry land, he's, built, he's created light, and, and he's put vegetation on the ground, but there's no living, thinking thing to rule over it. What's going to be interesting is on days 4, 5, and 6, and this will be relevant to hospitality. We're still on hospitality, believe you me. On day 4, 5, and 6, what he's going to do is create living beings and, and, and creatures that can rule over those spaces. So we have the sky with the light and darkness, we have the land with its vegetation, and we have the sea. Well, someone needs to rule over those things. And this is a huge thing. God begins to design creatures who can rule over those different spheres, the sky, earth, and sea. So this is the first thing that happens in verse 14. On day four, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons, days and years. And then in verse 16, God made two great lights, the greater the light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. So here's the idea. In the creation story, when God creates the sun and the moon, what he's doing, and I know this is crazy for us, as we've seen them, we've walked on the moon at least. We haven't walked on the sun, believe it or not. And our song's about it. Again, you're just disappointed, man. I can tell. I don't get to drive a Bentley. I don't get to walk on the sun. I'm out. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just messing with you, man. Uh, what's your name, by the way? Because I think we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about you again probably. Austin. Okay, very good. Austin, we're going to be good friends by the time we're done, especially if you stay right there the whole weekend, okay? You don't have to. A lot of people move after the first session. <laughs> All that said, um, uh, when he creates the sun and the moon, look what it says. Despite the fact that we think of these as inanimate objects, in the story, they're created to to do what in the middle of verse 16? Quote, to rule, to reign. Now, we could talk about how the sun and moon reign, but here's the point that's being made here. God is now showing us that he is a delegator of authority. So when he creates the sky, he could rule it directly. He could just be the micromanager who has no middle management, but instead he says, I'm going to put something there to rule over it. And so he creates the sun and the moon. He's getting us ready for what our role is, by the way, but he wants to have something to rule over. So he puts the sun and the moon there to rule over the day and the night. God's a delegator. The next thing he does is look at, well, the sky is populated by rulers. Well, you need something living in the sea to govern it, right? Like a Leviathan that can rule over the waves. And Job, well, we'll get that in verse 20. The next day, on the fifth day, God said, let the water swarm with living creatures. And he fills the sea with creatures to rule over it, Right? And then on the sixth day, the first part of the sixth day, what does he do? He puts animals on the earth to walk over the earth, and he creates the cow to eat the grass, not the grass to eat the cow. So there's a sense in which animals and fish and sun and moon are like these things that are designed in some way to rule over their varying spheres. Now, now you might think, well, how do they rule over things? I do want to suggest to you, insofar as sin has broken the world, we really don't have any idea what this would have actually looked like. I mean, you, sh- you should get like, when there's a talking snake in a minute, and we kind of go, that's a little freaky, I think this is probably a myth. The, the, the strangeness of this world is not a sign of, the, of its fantastical nature. It's a sign of how far we've fallen that it seems strange to us. When you encounter God, you're the weirdo. You're, and this is actually true in 1 John. I don't know if you know this. When you encounter God, in 1 John we're told, you don't make any sense. I, I don't have time to go into how that makes sense. I'll just, I'll just say this. There's this contradiction in John where believers don't sin. 
you're believers and you sin. And we go, huh, God makes no sense. And he goes, no, the point is, you don't make any sense. So as you confess your sin, God changes you so that eventually you make sense. You know what makes sense? Someone who's a servant of God who doesn't sin. That makes sense. You're confusing weirdos right now. You are twisted, bent frames of people. And, and you don't make sense. You're literally a paradox. So the point I'm trying to make is this. I don't know what it looks like for a cow to be a ruler. I, I'll, I'll find out one day. I don't know. It, it'll be interesting, right? One day, eventually on the new earth, I might walk up to a cow and say, hey, what exactly do you do? Uh, I don't know. Okay. The, the point is, you have these animals now. Now, interestingly then, uh, on uh, 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 the sixth day, he's created the animals. And if you know the pattern of creation, you think he's done. Okay, you had the sun and moon, you have the fish, you have the animals. Each day you had one thing. We're done. But he's not done. The second half of the sixth day, he creates the last, most powerful, most beautiful, most dominion-oriented creature of all. Okay, so what he's going to do here, you see how God's delegating authority over the earth or over creation to things? He has given the sun and moon the night and the day. He's given fish the sea. He's given animals the earth. But he's going to put a ruler over all of that. There's a hierarchy here. But what does he do? On the sixth day, the second half of the day, we get verse 26. God said, let us make human beings, man. In our image, our thelem, after our likeness. So the Hebrew word here for image is the word thelem. I just said it. it's hard to say. It starts with a T-S, thelem. Okay? Uh, and uh, it's a word that to us, when we look at the image of God in creation, we, we wonder, what, what is this? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And people try to answer different ways. Usually what we do is we try to figure out how are we different than animals? That must be the image of God. Well, they can't think rationally. So reason is the image of God in man, right? Or some people, well, animals don't have moral will, or they're not, you know, they don't have a sense of morality about them. So maybe morality is the image of God and man. That all misses the point of how images work in the Old Testament. I know some of y'all probably know this already. I hope you do, because this is becoming more common to talk about. But the idea of an image in the uh, ancient world, a tselem, it referred typically, not always, but typically to an object carved out of wood, or more often, stone carved out of dust, actually, which is what stone is. It's just dirt. They knew that. They weren't dumb. It was an image carved out of the dirt that represented, typically they were used to represent kings and authorities throughout the ancient world. So, you know, nowadays we don't really do a lot of this. We, we are a very image-based culture, but we don't do our images in hard and fast sculptures and such. We have visual, like, digital images. But in the ancient world, the world was covered with statues of kings and powerful people. Okay, they were covered with thelum. This is very important. So like if you walk into a temple in Egypt, there might be, a, there, this is actually true in Luxor, there might be a 60-foot statue on both sides of Ramses II who built that temple and reigned over it. You know, if, if you were to go even into Baghdad just a few years ago, right in the middle of the city, there was this giant selim, this, this statue of Saddam Hussein. And even there in Baghdad, you're seeing what the ancient use of a selim was. A selim was a graven image of a more powerful being that was set up in his kingdom to represent his authority and tell the world this belongs to so-and-so. In other words, it was a statue, an image of a higher power that actually represented in some way the presence of that power in a distant realm. It showed the territory of the higher power. In its grandeur, it revealed the power and the grandeur of the higher power it represented. And it, it, it just its very presence extended the authority of that king or of that pharaoh to that place, right? You get, like, uh, Austin. Doing okay? Okay. So Austin, if you walk into, uh, this would be really creepy. Well, okay, I won't use it. But let's just pretend you're, you're, a, you're a humble traveler in ancient Egypt, and you're going to visit the temple of Luxor, right? And you're from out of town. And you're walking into this temple of Luxor, and, you know, you've got just enough money to get back to wherever you came from. You're, you know, you're a broke peasant, so you're very similar to probably how you are at this exact moment, I'm guessing. Okay. I mean, you know, you're young. I was about your age. I was pretty broke. So unless you're flush with cash, just don't tell us. <laughs> So anyway, you walk into this temple, and there you are, you know, this roughly six-foot guy looking at this grand temple, and you look up, and as you walk in, there's a 60-foot statue of Ramses. He's not even looking at you, just looking off into the distance like this. And, you know, he's got giant pecs, and he's, he's, got, he's holding a spear, and his laws are written at the base of the statue, which is usually what Selim would often have, his laws written at the base. You're walking by, what is that telling you about this place? When you walk by, I mean, I, I won't expect you to answer, I mean, I don't know you could, but you get, when you're walking by, as this little flesh and blood man, here's this 60-foot monolith, you're realizing, first off, uh, this belongs to that guy. It's not mine. You didn't build it and put it there. He did, right? Uh, it's, it's as if like a little kid were to put a picture of themselves on their bedroom door. This is my room now, right? But you're also getting a sense of the grandeur and power of Ramses II. I mean, you, didn't, you can't do that, right? I, I, in the modern world, I couldn't build a 60-foot sandstone statue of myself. I lacked the resources. Pretty impressive. 
Here's the point I'm getting. I usually love to go on and on about this, but we don't have a lot of time. What God intended human beings to be, carved out of the dust, just like a Selim, we'll find out in the next chapter, was to be walking, talking images, not benignly of him, but literally of him, to be like an extension of himself in time and space. To go out into the world as walking, talking Selim that represented the extent of his reign, the grandeur of his power, the beauty of his, of his, of his appearance, all those things. That's what we were meant to be, the presence of God on earth in a priestly fashion serving uh, in that role. I'm going to try to move this over to where y'all can see it, so I probably should have done that earlier. This could end catastrophically. This is one of those moments you dread as a speaker where you might end up on YouTube. <laughs> speaker falls over whiteboard, you know? Yeah. Are you okay with that? You sure? Are you guys okay with that? If you're not, just don't say so. It'll make me feel better, okay? <laughs> if you're like, no, let's, let's, let's be done. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. All right. So uh, this is a small whiteboard. I hope you can see what I'm doing here, okay? So the idea we're getting here in creation when God makes man as his selim, and we've already seen this with the sun, moon, and stars, is God has designed an earth full of good things. It's an amazing place. It's a realm to rule over. And you all know the kingdom of God in the New Testament covers the whole earth. God has always intended to rule the earth himself. But we've already seen he's not going to do it directly. He's going to delegate it to sun, moon, animals, fish. But here's God who could rule over the earth directly micromanage the whole thing. He's got infinite ability. But for whatever reason, I love this about him because if it wasn't true about him, I'd just be another animal. He likes to delegate. And what he's doing is when he creates man as his image, firmly planted on the earth, made from dust, he makes us as the means of extending his rule over the earth. And in the ancient world, it was understood that whenever you have an image, there is something of the being in the image. I know that in our way of thinking, it's like, nah, it's just an image. Like when we have a picture of ourselves, you take a picture. No, you ever heard of cultures that don't want pictures taken because they think you're stealing their soul? You ever heard of that? There are some cultures out there, we call them primitive, which we probably shouldn't, that believe that when you take a picture of somebody, you take a part of them. And we go, how naive. Is it? Is it naive? Have you really figured out this whole visible, invisible thing perfectly? Do you understand how the material and immaterial world relate perfectly? Read the book of Hebrews and tell me if you have a very clear picture of where truth really resides. Is it really what you can touch, taste, see, and feel? There are deeper truths that material things manifest. I want you to understand something. Some of you have experienced what it's like to have just a picture of you shared where it shouldn't have been shared. If you don't, you can imagine what that's like. But it's just a picture. Who cares? It's, just, it's, not, even, it's not connected to you in any meaningful way. Once it was taken, it ceased to be a part of your life, a part of who you are. Oh, no, it remains part of you. There's something of you that goes with your image when it's sent out into the world. This is why celebrities are so messed up. When millions, is, millions of versions of you are out there, they're still connected to you in some way that still control people's understanding of who you are, of your authority in the world, of the extent of your name. Every time your image is shared in the world, a little piece of you goes out that now is a part of who you are. And celebrities can tell you, when their images are plastered all over the media, they have a hard time becoming anything other than what they've become through those images. What I'm trying to suggest to you is this. In a mystical, powerful way that I think moderns have a hard time understanding, there is an actual presence of the powerful being in the Tselem. So in the ancient world, for instance, they worshipped idols. They knew idols were just rock. They knew that, but they believed the divine presence of their God would inhabit that material form. Okay? So, I'm just trying to show you all. This is actually the case. That as, insofar as we're the Tselem, we should fully expect that we're not just lookalikes. We are, in fact, in some way, the extension of God's very presence on the earth. And you might think, well, that's just overreaching, Bill. Is it? Look at what happens in chapter 2 of Genesis. How are we made? I love this, y'all. This is the grace of God. We don't deserve it. And that's going to be the point by the end. This is why it's hospitality. When God makes Adam and Eve, he doesn't make them like he makes the other stuff, where he just sort of moves stuff around and creates boundaries. In Genesis chapter 2, if you remember, it's going to be on verse... Uh, no, I don't have it with me right now. It's like around verse 5, where he takes man and he forms him out of the dust. Remember this? When he wants to make Adam and Eve, Adam, it says the Lord took the dust of the ground, which is what he's made everything else from. But he doesn't just make a man out of it. He puts something else into the dust. Y'all remember, what does what God put in the dust? Yeah, his breath, his nephesh. Now, in the New Testament, by the way, the breath of God is the Holy Spirit. So this is very important. In the, in the New Testament, when God gives the Holy Spirit to indwell Christians, he's redoing creation. 
He's taking their broken bodies and putting his breath back into them so that they can become human again. And thereby animates. And this is really crazy. In the creation story, human beings are not just another vegetable. We're not just another cow. Thank God. Even though you, you know, in our culture, it's kind of the norm to say that now. What's the difference between a, a human and a puppy? The same thing nowadays. You know? It's ridiculous. No, there's a vast difference. You're not just animals walking the earth like you know, material objects. God takes the dust, and then he says, what I'm about to make is not merely creation. I'm going to put myself in it. So he breathes his own life into it. And, and, and this is so powerful. It's, it's a way of showing us that human beings are unique in creation. And this is by the grace of Almighty God. So don't get heady about this. Don't get proud about this. But this is his gift to us. That he designed us not to be merely dust, but to stand somehow between the ground and heaven as these intermediate beings who are at once creatures, but also imbued with his own divine breath. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is how he intended all humans to live, which is why he becomes the model for all of us. Now, he's unique. I don't mean that we're like him. But God always intended that human beings be creatures who are made both of dust and of his own breath, filled with his life. So we are not merely creatures. We are certainly not God. But from the beginning, God has wanted us to participate in his life so that when Adam walks around, God is going with him. His breath is in his bones. His breath is in his lungs. Y'all catching all of this? It's a really powerful image of what God intended human beings to be. So he existed as to rule over creation on his behalf, to exist between, to be the intermediate rulers of all of these things. If you don't think that's true, look what he says of the image here. The image has more to do with function than with identity. Look what it says here in verse uh, 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I'll say this about likeness. This is gonna, we're almost to hospitality. The likeness here, that second word, does have this idea. Not only will this be a cellum that looks, acts, and is an extension of my presence in time and space, it is to act like me. So he's emphasizing this fact. Humans rightly created act like the creator. They do what he does the way he does it. And you might go, that's a bit of an overreach. We're not meant to do God's work the way God does it. Oh, yes, we are. Look what he says. To explain what it means to be in the image and in the likeness of God, he says this. And, and that word and in Hebrew connects this idea to what just came before. In other words, let me explain to you people what I mean by making them in our image, in our likeness. And, you can think, therefore, let them have dominion, rule over the fish of the sea. They're the ones who rule the sea. The birds of the heavens, well, they with the sun, moon, and stars rule the air. And every living thing that moves on the earth. So you see, now we rule over them, we rule over the whole creation. He's given us authority to rule over the whole thing which makes sense if we are his tselem. Remember, an image represents the authority, extent, and reign of a king. But then he says this, look in verse, uh, 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 yeah, well, you see there to the end of the verse, we're to rule over all things. And then in verse 29, he tells us, behold, I give you everything necessary for life. And we're getting really close to now talking about hospitality. He's built a world as a home for him to live in. We know God wants to live in the world. The whole Bible is about God eventually filling the world with his presence. That's how the book ends. God walks on the earth with humanity. He's building a home. He builds this home and then he puts these two strangers in it and he gives them his home. He gives them his food. I mean, understand that this garden, the garden and table go together. It's as if he's saying, come into my house that I made that you don't own, you have no right to whatsoever and live in it. And not just live in it, it's yours. Rule over it. And not just rule over it, I've given you everything you need. My table is yours to eat from. These are his vegetables, his fruits. He says, they're yours to eat. And so he tells them, welcome to my home. It's yours now, and you can eat whatever you want. This is hospitality, y'all, on a radical level. When you keep in mind that even though Adam and Eve are not yet sinners, they are strangers in the sense that they are not God. They have not yet had a relationship with him. There has to be something to establish that. This is what establishes it. And... This is hard for our American minds. They have no rightful claim to what God owns whatsoever. If God were a little bit too American, and I'm an American, I'm proud, I think this country is a gift from God, I really do. But we can go a little crazy sometimes with individual rights and not recognize that your right of property in God's economy exists so that you might freely give it away to others. So the government shouldn't take it, but you should give all of it. And a lot of the reason why the government does take is oftentimes because Christians don't give and there's a lot of need that's not met. Wouldn't be a, whole big, wouldn't be a huge homeless problem if Christians were hospitable. There'd be a little bit. Some people just won't go with the program. You know, some people won't be helped. You know, abortion? I guarantee you there'd be a whole lot less abortion if young women in crisis were eating at our tables, being loved by our families, being brought into our life, being shown light, order, and life in the home of a believer. 
And that does happen, by the way. Some of y'all may even ministered with crisis pregnancy centers. That's a kind of hospitality where we build something with our resources and say, come sit at our tables, eat our food, share our life together. So I'm just telling y'all, the gospel message compels you to believe that God has given you much to give all of it away. This is what he says to Abraham. I'm going to bless you so that you may be a blessing to all others. So he's being hospitable here. He feeds them in verse 29. I've given you everything to eat. Even the animals, I'm going to let them eat from the table as well. And then uh, the last thing I want to point out to you here uh, in this part of the story before I go into what it means for hospitality is if you go again into uh, uh, chapter 2, you'll see that idea of being um, you know, created with the divine breath in us. There's also something in chapter 2 that happens where we're told to work the garden and keep it. So here, here's what I want to say to you before getting into hospitality. What we're seeing in this story right here, insofar as human beings are like an idol built in God's image, by the way, I don't know if you know this, throughout the whole Bible, humans are constantly trying to build idols. The reason why God doesn't want us to build images is because he makes his own images. I mean, some might go, he doesn't want to be bound up in an image. That's what Jesus Christ is. He's a man in whom God fully dwells. God is, is heaven bent on putting an image of himself to worship in creation. He's going to make it. He's going to fashion it. Don't you do it. Right? So, that, so God is an idol maker. I know that sounds weird to us to hear. But the original tselem, that's a word for idol oftentimes in the ancient world. The original idol of God's power was humanity. It was human beings imbued with his divine breath and presence. So he puts an image of himself on the earth and tells us to go work the earth and keep it, which is what the priests will later do in the temple. They're told to go, quote, work and keep the temple. Okay, I wish I had hours to talk about the temple as a new earth kind of image. Let me just say this, and we'll, uh, I, hope you, I hope you agree with me, okay? The original creation in this story and later on in the Old Testament, we can see God intended to be a kingdom where he ruled through humanity. It was supposed to be a temple where humanity was the priest, mediating God's authority to earth and his words, and mediating earth's worship back up. This is why the Psalms are full of let all creation worship, and it's a call to the Israelites to worship in the temple. God has always intended that humans exist as intermediate kings and queens and as priests in the world temple. And not just as that, I don't have time for this because I need to get on. He also wants us to be uh, children in his house. So the earth was meant to be a kingdom ruled by humanity, God through humanity, a temple mediated by the priesthood of humanity, and a family in which the children were human beings. Okay? And this is all going to relate to hospitality in just a second. Now, I want you to think about what all this means for you and your desires. One of the reasons why I love teaching the creation story is because I know for a fact all of you want some things. Would anybody agree in here that you have desires in your heart that are currently unmet? Anybody have any desires in life that are currently unmet? Raise your hand if you have desires that are unmet. The universal thing, if you don't have your hand up, you're just a liar, and that's okay. God loves you. God adores you. I adore you. Come eat at our table, right? It is universal. Frustration is universal. No one's ever lived this life and gone, I would be happy if this was my eternity. Doesn't mean we want to die. You have these deep desires for things like immortality, don't you? Like y'all know, everybody hates death. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't suicide, but even suicide in a way is the way to avoid living a dead life. We want to live, and not just in the sense of having a pulse. We want to live something like a lachaim, like a fullness of life, right? We want to live. We don't want to die. We fight it. We fight with cosmetics. We fight it with, you know, youth obsession. We fight it with medication. We fight with exercise. The last thing we want to do is die. We just don't want to die. Well, now you know why. It's not because... You're a sinner. You are a sinner, and that, that desire is corrupted in you. But, but that desire comes from your created purpose. You were designed to be an immortal who lives forever, enjoying immortality from the hand of God. Adam and Eve are not mortal beings. They are going to live forever because God, reigning over them as the delegated authority, feeds them through hospitality. So long as you sit at the table of God, you never die. There's life aplenty, right? It's part of the feast is life itself. It's true in the New Testament. I'm really rushing through things I usually explain further. Other desires y'all have. Y'all have a desire, for instance, for belonging to a community of people who love you and, and, who, and who honor you and who value you and whom you can trust, right? We all have that desire. Even our removal from society is often our way of manifesting our desire for real community. Our isolation is often our rejection of a community we don't want or are afraid of because we want a real community of people who love us, value us, and can be trusted. We all want to be a part of a family, basically. A real family in our own ways. Well, do you see now where that desire came from? You were designed to live in the household of God with him as your father, walking with you in the garden, living with perfect beings who will never betray you. I mean, you were designed to have belonging and friendship and love and intimacy with all kinds of people and creatures. You can go through every desire that you have, the desire for beauty. Oftentimes we think beauty is a bad desire. Beauty is a great desire. God designs beautiful things. You were supposed to be beautiful in creation. The ugliness of man is a consequence of the corruption of the beauty God intended. 
An image bears the beauty of its creator. The statue of Ramses is grand because its creator is grand. Adam and Eve would have been really hot, is what I'm getting at. (laughs) And I don't just mean that in a sexual sense. I simply mean they would have been beautiful before the ugliness of sin had crept in. And your desire for beauty is not misplaced. Now you go the wrong direction with it in sin. Sin is a temptation we'll see later to fulfill a God-given desire in a God-forbidden way. But all the desires of your heart that are unsatisfied exist because God gave them to you. He designed you to be an immortal, prosperous king, queen, priest, and child of God living immortally on the earth forever under his benevolent hand. Not because you deserve it, but because he's just that generous. Every desire you have comes from that, right? And we're going to see later how the gospel doesn't reject that desire. It actually fulfills it. Now to him who's able to do more for you than you could ever ask or imagine is what the New Testament says, okay? That's what that desire comes from. Now, what does this have to do with hospitality? Because I've got to wrap this up. What does it have to do with hospitality? So, you all look in the New Testament, you'll know that in Romans 5, for instance, we're told that Jesus Christ is a second Adam. All right? The first Adam screws up. Everything falls apart. The world goes back into darkness, death, and chaos. So we have the flood, Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, my life, right? Before Christ. So the world falls apart. In, in, the, in the story of the gospel, part of what God is doing is through the forgiveness of the cross and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, God is calling a new humanity together. That's why in, in 2 Corinthians 5, we're told that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The word, new creation. He's in the word creation. Jesus is the second Adam, the founder of a new humanity. In ways I'll show later, it is the case that Christians are people who are being invited not into an escape plan from hell, but in fact into a plan by which God is going to establish a new earth full of second Adam family people. So, so if you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, 21 and 22, I don't know if you'll know this, we don't end up in heaven forever. But that's just not where we end up. It's somehow gotten into our way of talking. Well, when I die, I don't go to hell, I go to heaven forever. We don't go to hell, praise God. We go to a new earth that is like this one, only better. And I don't know if I'll cover it here or not, depends on how much time we have. But the, if you go to the book of Revelation, John doesn't see a new heaven full of naked baby angel Christians. He sees a new earth with a city in it and nations and people living by the light of God's presence. We're actually headed toward a new creation that's better than this one. But before God brings about a new creation, he has to create a people who can keep it, who won't lose it. The story of Noah tells you that. If he created a new world now and gave you a perfect life, you'd ruin it because you're broken. So the story of the gospel is God's preparing new human beings for a new earth. So what does this have to do with our homes? Very simple. If in Christ you're recovering your created purpose to be the image of God on earth, and y'all we're told to be like Christ who is the image of God, okay? The church is the body of Christ on earth. Insofar as we in the gospel have a chance to recover our proper role by God's grace through Jesus Christ, the pioneer of our faith, it is the case that we can begin to use our homes now as a place where God's work of new creation is unfolding. So you remember, Adam's job was to go onto the earth, and I didn't have time to look at this, and to finish the work of creation. He's told, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. All those things are things God's been doing. Y- y- y'all remember... Uh, like when, when, when Adam's told, look in verse, um, uh, where is it? Uh, oh, right here in verse 28. When God says to Adam, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, he tells him to do four things. These are all things God has been doing. But look, he says, be fruitful. That, that just means to bring life into dark places, into void places. Well, who's been bringing life this whole story? God has. Then he says, multiply. Well, who just multiplied himself by creating man? God did. He created man in his image. So he's being told, go multiply yourself the way I did. And then it says, fill the earth. Well, who's been filling the earth with all kinds of things? God's been doing that, creatively filling the earth. And then he says, subdue it, which means to bring order to the chaos. This is very important. When God created Adam and Eve as his intermediate kings and queens, priests in his kingdom, children in his household, he also commissioned them to go out and keep doing what he's been doing. Okay? So, as new Adams in Christ, new Eves, we have the opportunity now to go out and be like our God, to imitate Christ as he is the image of God, right? So what does that mean with your home? You have an opportunity in your home to create a space in this world that instead of being full of darkness, death, and chaos, by the presence of God and his word in it, to be a place that shows people what God really meant for us to live. And people need to know that. A lot of people think of God as a vindictive, judgmental, spiteful, unkind, pleasure-forbidding rule-making cruel father, largely because that's how most of our fathers live. I'm not saying all of them, but we get that from our parents and from, and from sin. I'm not saying it's all our parents' fault. It's not all your parents' fault. But they're sinners, you're sinners. We've just perpetuated this idea of him as this petulant father who makes rules and takes too much from people. 
But you know, in a world full of darkness, death, and chaos, it sure would be nice for people to realize that God did not intend for them to live that way. But how are they going to know that if they don't see it? You can go tell people all day long, be warm and filled, but then you walk away and they're like, that meant nothing. You can say God loves you and has wonderful plans for you, but if they never see it on display, it's meaningless, and they'll laugh at you on social media, disdain you, and go about their merry way. But what if Christians prayerfully brought the presence of God into their homes through the word and intentionally began to build homes that are full of light, order, and life, all of which come from the word of God? What, what if, we, well, if you did that, and then you went to your strange friend, by that I mean stranger, I'm sure a lot of your friends are strange, but I just meant the stranger. And you know, you say, God did not intend for us to live this way. He created the world for us to enjoy him forever and to enjoy peace and love and prosperity. And they're thinking, I have no idea what you're talking about. Then you say, by the way, come have dinner in my house. They come into your house and they see an outpost of the new Eden. And, and, And the way this works starts with just bringing the word of God in. You should be devoted, whether you have a house with a single person living in it, three guys with one spoon between them, or you have friends, or you, doesn't matter what kind of kids, it doesn't matter what kind of house you have, you make sure that every day at some point in that home, the word of God opens and is spoken in that home. Read the word daily, and as you do that, submit to it, and your home will begin to be filled with the light of truth. People will confess their sins to one another and reveal themselves for who they really are in the light of God's presence. Truth will be spoken, promises will be kept. The home will become full of order. Boundaries will be respected. Covenants will be kept. People will be trusted. The chaos will dissolute into a kind of order in the family and in the home. It'll be clean and presentable. It'll be a place for someone to go in the world where they're going like this. They come to your house and it's like this. A place where they can orient themselves. If you bring the word of God and it won't just create light in your home and order, it will also bring life where there is death. Which means partially that you will potentially, if God wills, have children. That's one sign of God's work in this world. And if you have children with faith in God's word, the children and their maturation and the harmony of your home is a demonstration of you being fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth, and subduing the chaos. Showing people a picture of what God always intended. But don't just fill it with children. Put plants in it. Put animals in it. Put music in it. Put food in it. Create a home that is an image of what God always intended creation to be. And you will enjoy in that oasis a break from the darkness, death, and chaos of this world. But also, once you've done that, once you've built a home where God's word has filled it with life, order, and light, do what he did with it. Don't lock the front door. Don't sit back and say, look at this earth I've created. I think I'll eat all the food myself. Go out and do what he did with Adam and Eve. Find somebody who has no rightful claim who is wandering about in the darkness, death, and chaos, grab their hand and say, come to my home with me. Come, eat at my table. Sit on my couch. Cry and find comfort. Hear the word of God shine light in your life. Come experience the peace and tranquility of a Christian home that is like the new earth. And when they come in, read the Bible with them. We do this all the time. If you come to my house and eat dinner, you're reading the Bible and singing. I don't care if you're an atheist. Very awkward for some of them. But we do, every day. It's just normal for us. Not normal for everybody, but it's normal for us. And they come in and they see that and they see love and they see, you get what I'm saying, and they see life. But be hospitable with your home as a sign of what God intended for humanity and that will show people God is not a malevolent, petulant father making rules that are no fun to keep. It'll show them a picture of a world where men and women are achieving immortality, glory, beauty, life, family, etc. Does all make sense to you guys? And if you do that, you'll have the joy of, of being, by God's grace, more and more human every single day. This is very possible, and we'll talk more about it. So I'm just going to pray. Father, thank you so much for the scriptures. Thank you for the testimony of creation. I pray you will help each one of us by your grace. We have to do it by your grace. We need your forgiveness and your power. But I pray that you, through your word, would help each of us become representatives of your kingdom. Kings and queens in your kingdom, priests in your temple, children in your family, like Ephesians says. Help us to live out those roles in our homes by creating these outposts of the kingdom, these outposts of the new earth, these outposts of Eden. And then, Father, give us the strength and wisdom to do what you did with all that beauty, goodness, and truth. Go out and find people who have no claim on it and invite them in so that others might, through our grace and sacrifice, learn about your grace and sacrifice. Thank you, Father, for your love, which sought us first. In Christ's name we pray by the power of the Spirit. Amen.